tuning in to the 2020 Mineral Symposium of the Pacific Northwest Chapter of Friends of Mineralogy. This is our first virtual symposium due to the current health restrictions because of the global pandemic, so we're glad that you're able to join us here today. Continuing along our 2020 theme, Aesthetic Minerals, Color, and Crystallography, our next speaker is Dr. Raquel Alonso Perez. Raquel is curatrix of the Mineralogical and Geological Museum of Harvard University. She got her bachelor's degree in geology from the University of Granada in Spain, her FGA from the Gemological Institute of Great Britain, or GEMA, and her PhD in Earth Sciences from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, or ETH, in Zurich, Switzerland. Raquel's teaching strengths are optical mineralogy and gemology, and her main research interests are in the mineralogy and geology of gem deposits. She is secretary of the Society of Mineral Museum Professionals, or SMMP, and the editor of Gems and Gemology, and also the Journal of Gemology. And now Raquel Alonso Perez in her talk, Emerald and Gemstone Formation During Continental Growth Episodes. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction and invitation to the Friends of Mineralogy Pacific Northwest Chapter Seminar. It's a pleasure to be virtually with you here today. Before I dive more into my research topic of today, I would like to tell you more about the collections of the Mineralogical and Geological Museum at Harvard University, which is one of the oldest and continuously operated mineral museum in the United States. Currently, the collection consists of more than 400,000 objects, which is the results of research in mineralogy, petrology, mining geology, and planetary sciences. The collection is classified on four subsets, which are the rocks and ores, meteorites, minerals, and gems. The rock and ore deposit collection consists of more than 200,000 objects, and this is a very unique uh, collection because it's based on field trips by faculty and students, and some of these specimens cannot be mined anymore because either the mines have been exhausted or the, uh, the mines are also closed. The meteorite collection consists of uh, 1,600 objects, so relatively smaller, but it's a very historically important collection and there is a broad representation of faults and findings which are with a specimen weight range from 0 0.1 gram to 180 kilos. On your right, you can see one of the beautiful palisades, the Escalte from Argentina. The mineral collection, which is the one that we are really known for, consists of more than 100,000 objects. There is a fine a broad representation and occurrences in the collection. Most of the specimens are of fine quality, but we also have a large number of described illustrated and ore type specimens. The type collection in itself is around 700 specimens. On your right, you have one of the earliest kunzite uh, from Pala Chief that was, fine, was found by Kunz and arranged to be... Uh, gifted to the museum by A.C. Holden in 1895. The gem collection is a little bit smaller, similar to the meteorite collection, but nonetheless it's very important. It has a white representation of New England gem specimens and it's a collection that started by Palachi and thanks to the endowment by A.F. Holden. We currently receive also a donation from uh, Avin Evan German, and that's the picture on your right, which is a sphalerite from Spain. And since I tend to lose more people when I talk about science than when I talk about history, I'm going to give you my summary slides for, this, for the next uh, 30 minutes. So the take-home messages is that gemstones are important geochemical capsules for understanding Earth processes. In particular, Emeralds reveal information about continental collision zone processes and plate tectonics. 
And finally, emeralds span 3 billion years and represent new tools for understanding Earth history. So why are gems important? The purest form of minerals, which get cut and polished, they are amongst the rarest and most desirable of minerals known on Earth. It is throughout history they have played important roles in economics, politics, religion and fashion. From our geological point of view, which is what I'm interested from most, not always, but most, they hold unique geochemical fingerprints of geological processes. And traditionally, it was the study of gems that enabled the identification of natural materials versus synthetic and treated. And what I mean by this is, for example, in this picture, um, if I would be in person, I would be asking you which emera you think is, comes, is natural and which one you think is either synthetic or treated. And as you can tell, the one on, not, no, you can tell, but we, we know on the right, the, the picture on your left is the emera known as the Rockefeller emera, which went on auction for more than five million and a half of dollars, which it translates to a 0 0.2 grams of that emeralds is about $300,000. <laughs> Where the one on your right is a synthetic emerald that you can find on eBay for $500. So how can you tell which one is natural and which one is synthetic? And that was really traditional gemology. We have um, more techniques these days that allow us to tell more about them, especially the formation processes, which is what we are interested in. Now, among these high-end gemstones such as the Corundum family, like ruby, sapphire, diamonds, opals, berries, which is the beryllium alumina silicate, are some of the most desirable ones, not just because of the hardness, but also because of the colors. As a beryllium alumina-rich silicate, in his pure form, beryl is colorless, and that's the variety Goshenite the one on your upper right. Other varieties are aquamarine, which is bluish green to blue, and colored by iron on an oxidation state of as, as a three plus, like the one you have here from Ireland. Heliodor, or golden yellow beryl, is caused by impurities of iron, but on an oxidation state of a two plus. Green berry, which is basically any green color that is not deep enough to be emerald colored is actually colored by iron instead of chromium or vanadium, and vanadium, or a mix of both. <laughs> Morganite, the pink to peach, the one that you have on your left, is colored by manganese in a 2 plus. And red beryl, which is also known as the red emerald on the trade, is colored by manganese on a three plant state and minor amounts of chromium. There is only one locality where you can find red beryl, and that's on the Wawa Mountains in Utah. And of course, the queen of this talk, emerald, which is color is caused by um, chromium, vanadium and minor amounts of iron and a combination of all those three and I will talk more about that in a minute. Now emeralds are scarce as they require, they are very unique, as they require the unusual juxtaposition of aluminous, quartz, feldspatic, beryllium rich sources associated with continental crystal materials with compatible elements like chromium and vanadium, normally associated with ultramafic, magmatic and metamorphic rocks, and more typical of Earth's mantle. If we look at this table, we can see how to form an emerald you need more than 130,000 parts per million of beryllium, where you only have 2.1 parts per million of beryllium in the crust. On the other hand, if we look at the chromium and vanadium, to form an emerald, you need, you need more than 6,000 ppm or around that. There is no clear boundary 
of uh, in terms of concentration would really make up an emerald, but that's a fair estimate. And in this case, ultramafy rocks contains around 2,000 ppm parts per million of chromium in them. So as you can tell, you are almost putting two opposite reservoirs together in order to form an emerald. And that's why they are so rare. But despite these formation requirements, there are nearly 50 recognized emerald deposits occurring across North and South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, and Australasia. And ranging in formation age from the Archean, around 3 billion years old, up to the Cenozoic, 9 million years old. Major producers of emeralds are Colombia, Brazil, Zambia, Russia, Zimbabwe, Madagascar, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. These deposits can be classified based on the association of tectonic processes with magmatism, so tectonic magmatic related, metamorphism, tectonic metamorphic related, or both. And sedimentary, so depending basically on the which environment and which host rocks. That's the most current classification by Giuliani et al. 2019. For example, type 2b, are classified as Colombian emeralds, is a type as sedimentary in origin, whereas type IA, which are the most common emerald deposits type, have as a host rock ultramafic mafic protholite that have been intruded by granite pegmatite, and as we will see later, to major orogenies. Some of these, the ones that will be shown during this study, are the ones from Madagascar, Zambia, South Africa, and Brazil as a type IA, and Colombia as the archetype for type 2B. Now, if we put that classification and examine the distribution of these deposits based on it, it's quite easy to identify two predominant deposit types. The vast majority of emeralds, 80%, are related to granitic melts that have interacted with mafic, ultramafic host rocks, type IA. And as we can see, related to major orogenies. And I come back again to this map quite often. <laughs> yes, so um, you get to see what my passion lies. So overall, emeralds are a geochemical capsule as they can contain impurities including the chromophore, as well as a multitude of trace elements that would allow us to use the geochemistry for provenance and to trace synthetic, and more importantly, to examine their formation environments. To accomplish these goals, we selected 50 samples from 13 different worldwide deposits. We analyzed natural and synthetic samples from the MGMA collections, historical samples, such as the Colombian ones, which is type, uh, the image on the figure B, as well as recent donations, for example, the one from Nigeria, which is figure A. We also analyzed all the burials, like reds, heliodor, aquamarine, but not going to talk about them during this talk. In terms of uh, host rocks, we use samples from the gill mines in the Mananjari area in eastern Madagascar. This deposit is the archetype IA, as I will show you later. In these images, you can see how in Madagascar there is another deposit located in the south, the Ianapera. And field work in this area can be challenging because of the uh, higher amount of uh, vegetation. It's very difficult to find where... Outcrops, so for geologists it's not the best, but we were able to do a nice good field season back in 2017, I believe. Up on your left are some of the rough material coming from the jeans mine. And a little bit more detail to give you an idea on how these rocks look like in the field, 
the emerants are hosted within a phlogopi actinolite rich metasomatic reaction zone or the so called black wall. You can tell on that picture almost on the middle where you have these quartz of vein and tiny green dots. Those are where the those are the emerants. Sometimes you have mid felsic ignites that are often intercalated with these layers and cross cut by pegmatites of a late Pan African stage. Talc serpentinite schist are also interbedded with the magmatic gneiss. Now, as you can imagine, some of the most challenging aspects of analyzing or working with gemstones is that you need to look for non destructive techniques. And in this case, uh, we use Raman spectroscopy, which is a beautiful um, non destructive technique. It's very powerful because you can tell a lot about the mineral structure in itself. So basically the crystallography of the emera. And although I'm not going to go into get into detail in here, but if anyone on the audience wants to know more about it, I'm happy to sh- get, by, get in contact by email and later on a phone if needed. I would like to point out that Fluorescence and polarization effects caused by the crystal orientation needs to be taken into consideration when doing Raman analysis. Just to tell you a little bit what I really mean about fluorescence, when you are analyzing these uh, MRs with high content of chromophores, there is a tendency to kind of the laser just overpower the spectra and what you tell what you get is a reading that just go up that's the red curve that you see on the upper diagram where you have raman shift on the x axis in centimeters and an intensity on the y axis on arbitrary units so a way to work around these fluorescent effects is to change the power of the laser something that was not reported on the literature and gave us a headache, but we finally overcome that problem. And polarization effect, this has been known because it depends of your crystallographic system. If you will have a cubic crystal, it doesn't matter in which direction you analyze, you will get the same reading. But because emeralds are hexagonal, you're going to have mainly two readings. So, and that is going to affect your shift on the Raman and also the intensity of some of the peaks. If we look at the whole Raman shift, which is usually between 50 and 3,800, most of the previous studies have been focusing on the fingerprint region, which is the one f- between 50 and 2,000. And that's the low frequency, which is going to tell you a lot about the metal ion oxygen bone vibration. So in general, the crystal structure. And as you can see from this diagram, there is no difference between Australia, Brazil, Colombia. Basically, there, is, there are minor differences between all these different localities. However, less attention has been put into the high frequency or H stretching modes that are located about 3,500. And that's where our interests lie, because we really want to know what's the fluids that are helping to form these emeralds in these environments. And that's where they're going to be located within the OH vibrations. So if we zoom in, and again, not really try not to go too much into detail in here, it can be observed that, for example, Colombia has a higher peak around 3,606 and a lower peak below that. Where, for example, Zambia and Madagascar is the opposite. Those are the blue and the green lines. They have a high intensity peak below 3,600 and a lower peak. So you are already telling, you can already distinguish some of the provenance. Some, however, this technique alone cannot tell you cannot discern between a Colombian emerald and a Russian emerald. Um, another important aspect of the Raman in this range is that has been established that the water, the type IA, 
is usually OH alkali free, which means most of the Colombian amylase, they don't have many alkalis, and that's what we know from the chemistry. On the other hand, the one that has a higher intensity peak at the type 2, type Madagascar, Zambia, they are going to have high content of alkali, CO2, and iron rich, which is actually what we observe. So it's a beautiful technique that can tell us a lot about the mineralogy and chemistry of the emeralds, but as a stand-alone technique, cannot tell you about the provenance. And that's where laser ICBMS come into play. Um, this is a method that is almost, is almost non-destructive, and I say almost because it requires limiting amount of sample and minimum damage. The 100 microns spot laser cannot be seen with the naked eye and with a minimal polish, the spot can be removed. This technique allows time resource signals and therefore it can also be used to monitor for inclusions and variation in crystal composition in addition to provide precise background corrections. The image on your left is a typical peak produced by a uh, laser and it's a thing that's 20 micron size it's ha- no it's 100 mi- the magnification is for is 50 and it's 20 microns for this study we used two different laser ablation icbms uh, labs and the reason to do that is because there are no standards to analyze emeralds which make it more difficult to compare your data with and therefore we wanted to make sure that our analysis were being precise and it's just a very good way to work with other colleagues. So for that we we analyzed the same sample set at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography which has a Thermo Fisher eye cap and use 100 micron spot size and the other one is in Alberta in Canada where we use a similar instrument they are both couple laser system with quadruple ICPMS. But in this case, we use a raster of 285 micron. And both instruments also has the ability to measure a large range of elements in the periodic table. However, laser elaboration has lim- limitations, mainly because of the amount of sample material. And that's why to study in depth the rare earth elements we did solution analysis. And in this case, this is a fully destructive technique. We have five to 10 milligrams of emeralds of samples. We are digested in hydrofluoric acid. The solution method was done at Scripps. And as you can see from these diagrams, because the concentration of chromium to strontium are typically high in emeralds, the correlation of solution data to laser data is almost perfect, but down to smaller concentrations such as the rare earth elements, the data get a bit spread out. In general, solution ICBMS enables the concentration of elements for analysis, and although inclusions can be incorporated, using major elements and laser ablation data can help to identify those mixed measurements. So for the next we need 20 minutes or so, I will be showing you the results of the solution ICBMS data and our interpretation of the data. And I would like to start with the sedimentary type, Colombia. The best defined method for emerald formation, and according to various studies in the 90s, especially by Ottawa et al., who is now uh, the curatrix at the GIA uh, Museum, they form as a result of evaporitic brines and black shale interaction. Despite more than 500 years of emerald mining in Colombia, it's still very artisanal. As you can see from the pictures, the esmeralderos usually carry a poncho around the next, the necks, sorry, and congregate in a mine. And if they are lucky and something is found, it can make it to the market. Now the picture on your right is a typical black shell host rocks of emeralds from the Chivor area. And these 
area is located in the eastern side of the Colombian Cordillera and four sixty five million years ago. The western side supposed to be younger, but recent studies also attribute it to sixty five million years old. By the way, it's very difficult to date emeralds, but we are on the process and people have done it with different methods. And the whole sequence of the Cordillera to form these emerald belts form during subduction with the formation of a sedimentary back arc basin and the sourcing of sediments from the Andean arc. Now, if we look at, geochemi- at the, geochemistry, the geochemistry of these emeralds, berries are usually classified based on the non-structural elements, usually substituting for alumina, such as chromium, vanadium, iron and magnesium. As shown in these plots, with emerald fields in different colors described by Giuliani et al., Colombian emeralds agree well within those fields and are characterized by high vanadium, chromium, and magnesium, and very important, low iron. And that's what makes one of the things that makes Colombian emeralds unique as iron is a supercent of the color green. In an incompatible trace element, showing the most incompatible elements in the left and normalized to continental crust on the y-axis, the most important characteristic of the Colombian emeralds is the enrichment of the element cesium, lithium, potassium, and lead, which are all widely associated with fluids. In the right-hand side of the plot, we can see the rare earth elements that range from lanthanum to iterium. And what you can probably tell is that these are relatively flat patterns, which means they have broadly the relative composition to the continental crust. Another important aspect is that the eastern and the western deposit have similar trace element patterns, which would agree also with probably the age of formation being similar, but not necessarily. Now, if we zoom in on the rare earth elements themselves, we see the mean composition as the green circle and the pattern is continental crust-like. This is actually consistent with the shade signature and thermal reduction of sulfate in presence of organic matter and black shade concurrent with the reduction of sulfates by organic matter basically the model that was proposed by Ottawa in 1994. Now, let's look at the most common type of ephemera, which are the igneous and metamorphic deposits, type IA, and occurring pretty much all over the world. But the ones I'm going to focus are Madagascar, Zambia and South Africa, where the most economically viable emeralds come from. By comparison to the sedimentary type, there is no coherent model of how these form, or a unifying link in how emeralds are formed has not previously been proposed, despite the fact that they are related to granite and metamorphic rocks. Another thing that we also know from the, these type IA emeralds is that many of the high-grade deposits are associated with the Neoproterozoic Mozambique band which is part of the Pan-African origin and the construction of Gondwana. This diagram shows the distribution of emeralds associated with it, and here are some pictures of the Madagascar deposit in the Mananjari area, which is dated at 500 million years ago. On the other hand, the gravelot in South Africa, which has been dated by second ages, on a nearby Pluton, has, be, has given an age of 3 billion years. As you can see, this type of deposits are also very artisanal, and although South Africa is more developed than Madagascar, technically speaking, and in general, <laughs> they will be very much a low mining operations type. One thing I would like to mention is that open pit is not allowed in Colombia and in the process of being and is also in the process of being established in Madagascar. So we can conserve those beautiful, amazing landscapes. 
Now, at the surface, the geology is very well described. Despite the vegetation, we could get that in this model in 2009 by Andrei Ahav. He described how emeralds form. There is a model that fits well with the field observation. So we have the pegmatitic veins, the fencing the phlogopite actinolite rich layer, and they have some fluids coming through. However, we still don't understand the mechanism that mobilize the fluids and neither the interaction with the host rocks to form the emeralds. So that's kind of the key question. The mechanism that mobilize the fluids and neither the interactions with the host rocks to form the emeralds. And using again the ternary diagrams to discern emerald provenance based on major elements, what is clear is that the type IA emeralds are much lower in vanadium than, for example, Colombian and other Colombian the archetype, sedimentary type IB, and they are also high in iron. In terms of the trace elements, the type IA emeralds are characterized by enrichments of cesium, lithium, a little bit potassium and lead, so very similar to Colombian. But they have a distinct heavy rare earth enrichment with an upturn pattern from erbium to ytterbium and lutetium. So could this upturn pattern be controlled by the host rocks? And the local pegmatites? That's kind of the questions. And to do that, to really check that, in this plot where we have incompatible trace elements for Madagascar eminence, normalized in this case to intruding pegmatites, which are the red squares, and also normalized to the black amphibole at the black squares, walk can be observed is the relative enrichment of the heavy rare earth elements in the emeralds relative to different rocks. If the emeralds were the same as the rocks, basically the protholy is there, they come from there, the line would be a one, or it would be completely flat, not necessarily a one, but completely flat, like we saw from the em- from the emeralds from, say, from Colombia. But in this case, they are still heavily enriched in cesium, lithium, and lead. And more importantly, they display again the upturn of the rare earth element patterns compared to the host rocks and the pegmatites. This suggests that the rare earth element composition of the emeralds are not related to the country rocks. And this is an unusual feature of the emeralds, which means it comes from a third component. And that's going to be the fluids delivering the beryllium to enable the emerald formation. Zooming into the rare earth element patterns and using, and using all the type IA average, which are the red cycles, and type 2B green, cycle, green circles, the emeralds from uh, Colombia, it is clearly that systematically there is an elevation from erbium to interbium relative to other rare earth elements pattern, no matter the location, the host rocks, or formation age. This is a persistent rare earth element signature very different from any other emerald type. So the next question is, which type of fluid is the cause of this signature? From the studies of delta D water in the emerald channels and delta oxygen, also in fluid inclusions within the emeralds, Giuliani and co for established that while Colombian emeralds plot within sedimentary and metamorphic waters, the type IA emerald plot within magmatic metamorphic waters. In this case, elements are ordered by uh, the delta D water versus uh, oxygen. So now we know that the fluids are magmatic in origin and coming back to this map done so far off and focusing on some of the type IAM and deposits, we can see that all of them are related to major origin, as I mentioned previously. During orogenesis, melting give rise to granitic rocks and we know that most of the type IA are associated with pegmatites or granitic melts. So next question again would be what kind of melt 
might we expect? There are four possible sources. An A-type, which is an anorogenic and anhydrous type of granitic melt, which is very unlikely because we need a lot of water to form the emeralds. The M-type, which is meant and also uh, we know they are related to orogenesis. An M-type, which is mountain derived and low in rubidium, thorium and uranium, also quite unlikely, especially because of the high concentration of those emeralds. And then finally, an S and an I-type granite, which could be quite likely. This enable us to develop a model of what type of fluids might come from this type of granite. So using partition coefficient of these mineral phases, model abundances for these granites, we model the evolution from partial melting to fractional crystallization. And this is the, those are the results. What we can tell is the I type, which is the gray lines, is characterized by light rare earth elements depletion, you can tell lanthanum cerium, due to main mineral phases fractionating in the assemblage, such as spinel and hornblende, titanite and hornblende, sorry. Whereas the S-type have relatively flat patterns for those elements, for the light rare earth elements, but can have prominent upturns on the heavy rare earth elements depending on the amount of fractional crystallization of, or um, partial melting. So if we now look and compare to our emerald patterns, we can tell that this enrichment from Erbium to Eterbium signature requires the involvement of magmatic fluids derived from sedimentary or supercrustal S-type granite melts, where garnet and cordyrite are present in the source. As you might expect, you will need significant fractionation of the fluids consistent with being related to late-stage granitic liquids. Here is a, a beautiful picture of the Mananjari deposit in Madagascar, which brings me back to the focus of the talk, which is to use gemstones to understand earth processes. And emeralds are intimately associated with orogenic events. Coming back again here to this uh, map, we can see that the emeralds occur in a large range of environments. And during this talk, I have focused on the type IA and the type 2B. But there are also other types I haven't mentioned, which have their own unique patterns, like the one from Austria, the one from uh, Egypt. So what does this all mean? It means that we can use them as a plate tectonic gemstone. Previously, Bob Stern proposed that sapphires, rubies, and jadeite were plate tectonic gemstones. Here is an image of a collision zone and the different areas. We would argue that emeralds are the archetype plate tectonic gemstones, not only formed during collision zones formation, but they have trace element signature that preserves the evidence for these processes. Here are some diagrams of evidence of plate tectonic from the Stern paper in 2013. You can see the distribution with time from 3 billion years ago from ophiolites, jade, blue schist, eclogites, all thought to be formed in subduction zone setting, as well as ruby and ultramafic high pressure rocks. All of these variations reflect plate tectonics, but some of it may also res reflect preservation. As you get old in time, preservation is poorer. So how do the emerald looks compared to this indicator? And here is the summary diagram. This compilation shows the relative distribution as a thickness of the bar. The thicker the bar, the more there is of the so-called plate tectonics indicators as a function of time. Also shown are major supercontinent episodes in Earth history. For example, Gondwana, Rodinia, and the Columbia supercontinents. 
As you can see, the abundance of evidence for plate tectonics increases after the formation of Gondwana, with indications of plate tectonic from massive pargins, sorry, from passive margins, ophiolites, blue schists, rubies, and sapphires, and of course, emeralds. What's particularly interesting, however, is the evidence for origin and plate tectonic processes as early as 3 billion years ago from emeralds, in particularly South Africa and Australian emeralds. Another interesting aspect of this diagram is the absence of emerald formation between 2 billion and 700 million years ago, yet the abundance of eclogitic diamonds inclusions, which are considered to represent recycled ocean oceanic crust. Evidently, there is still too much to be learned about emerald formation and plate tectonic processes, and I hope this diagram encourages you to think about this problem. And with that, I would like to go back to my take-home messages, which is gemstones are important geochemical capsules for understanding earth processes. In particular, emeralds reveal information about continental collision zone processes and plate tectonics. And emeralds span 3 billion years and represent new tools for understanding earth history. And with that, I would like to thank my collaborators and everyone that has also generously donated samples and funding for this uh, project that is still ongoing. Thank you so much. Music